Tonight's title is The Coin of Heaven. There are two sides to the coin, mind and speech. We are told in the 50th Psalm, To him who orders his conversations aright, I will show the salvation of God. Now there is a work that came out in the first century, just about the time that our evangelists were gathering together our Gospels. It's called the Hermetica. And in this work, today we have a translation in four volumes by Walter Scott. He said there are two gifts that God gave to man alone and to no other mortal creature. These are mind and speech. And with these gifts, these are equivalent to immortality. If a man uses these gifts rightly, he will differ in nothing from the immortals. And when he sheds his body, they will be his guides, and by them, he will be taken into the troop of the gods and into the souls of those who have attained to bliss. Now the Bible speaks much of this gift, but the word is not called always speech. It's called the way. It's called the path. It's called the tread. Here is the same word that I've just translated as conversation from the 50th Psalm. To him who orders his conversations aright, I will show the salvation of God. Now the word translated conversation, which is the Hebrew derek, is also translated the way. And here is now that wonderful chapter in Proverbs devoted to wisdom. And Christ is called the wisdom of God and the power of God. So now wisdom is personified and here we read the words. The Lord created me at the beginning of his way. The very first of his acts of old. Ages ago I was set up before the beginning of the earth. Well, that word translated way could be translated conversation. As we are told, his very first act was, let us make man in our image. So here, the Lord created him at the beginning of his word, his conversation. Let us make man in our image. Now we're invited to be imitators of God as dear children and use the same technique. For we have been given a gift that makes us immortal. The gift is mind and speech. And if we use these gifts wisely and rightly, we differ in nothing from the immortals. And they will be our guides after we shed these bodies and take us into the very troop of the gods and into those souls who have attained the bliss, immortality. Now, you and I must try it. We must test it. Is it really so? Do you mean that I can start right now without any background whatsoever? I know I have a gift of mine, I can think. I know I can speak. And were I dumb, I can still think and think in terms of words. If I could not express them in words, I can still think inwardly in these words. That's all that matters. If a man could only control his inner dialogue, he would find the most rewarding of all conversations. 
Oh, it's so easy, as Shakespeare said, it's so easy to teach others, teach twenty, what were good to be done. Yet he finds it so difficult to be one of the twenty to follow his own teaching. For all day long man is thinking, and if he thinks, he thinks in words, and he's talking, he's carrying on inner conversations with himself. But they're really dialogues. It's not a monologue. He is conjuring people in his mind's eye, two or more. And there he carries on these dialogues all through the day, all into the night. And he's arguing. Now that is not what we are taught in Scripture. God said, let us make man in our image. No argument. That was a decision made. And he never wavered in that decision. He's forming man into his own image. But he granted man the same gift to go berserk and to misuse that gift. If you and I this very night could decide what we want to be in this world, I don't care what it is, and then carry on these inner conversations from that assumption that we are already the man or the woman that we want to be, and then not waver in that assumption, we would really be imitating God as dear children. So I would say to everyone here, test it, try it to the very limit. I know from my own experience that it works. We have this immortal gift of mind and speech, and we do not differ in any respect from the gods. If we use it wisely, we will know we are not only immortal, but we are really the creative being of the world. Now listen to these words. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. I have just quoted the 45th chapter, the 5th verse of Isaiah. Besides me, there is no God. He gave me the same talent, gave us the same talent, which is himself, which is mine, and speech. I use the word imagination more often than I use the word mind, but here, to quote accurately, they say it was mind and speech. But I say I have the ability to imagine. I can form my thoughts in words. I can take my thoughts and form them into words that would imply the fulfillment of my dream. Am I now bold enough to assume that I realize my dream before it is visible in my world. Now listen to this fantastic promise as we read it in the 11th chapter of the book of Mark. Whoever will say to this mountain, be removed and cast into the sea, and will not doubt it is hard, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Now you can take the word mountain either actually or you can take it simply as an enormous problem. No matter what the problem is, and you can just say to it, be removed and be cast into the sea. And if you will not doubt in your heart that what you say will come to pass, it will be done for you. Now the next verse follows with this statement. Therefore, when you pray, believe that you have received and you will. I am called upon to assume that I am the man that I would like to be, and in spite of the mountainous opposition that would deny it. My reason denies it, my senses deny it, everything denies it. But I will persist in that assumption, and then it will be done for me in a way that no one knows. So can you conceive of this way spoken of in Scripture? Now the early Christians were called the people of the way. And the word way is simply the new conversations, as told us in Ephesians. Put off the old nature which belongs to your former conversations, and put on the new nature created after the likeness of God. So I am identified with my conversations, that my nature is simply my conversation. So mind, 
or rather speech is the image of mind and mind is the image of God if I would know what God is well then look at my speech for it is the image of mind and mind is the image of God so then we are told in Deuteronomy the word is not far from you it is in your mouth and on your tongue that you can do it see I have set before you this day good and evil life and death blessing and curse choose life that you may have and you and your descendants may live choose life but I can't deny the right of choice put before me the entire thing good and evil life and death blessings and cursing but the suggestion is given choose life I may want to actually rub someone out why leave it alone and choose something altogether lovely it'll take care of itself that monkey that seems to be my opposition it'll take care of itself it's all within me if I use the talents correctly and my gift from God to myself is mind and speech and I need not wait for the evidence to support it in spite of the lack of evidence I can precede it evidence will follow the most creative thing in us is to bring a thing into being and when the thing comes into being it follows what I did in my own wonderful inner conversations we are speaking beings speaking animals and as we are told he gave it to us alone and to no other mortal creature and this makes us the equivalent of the immortals we are immortal by reason of the gift of mind and speech now I can misuse it and the whole vast manifested world goes to show us what use or misuse we have made of the gift of God wars are simply brought about in the same manner I will go back to 1919 my father was no prophet he was not a man of the world living in a small little island in the West Indies and around the table I can hear him vividly now he was a ship chandler and supplied the ships with all of their needs especially groceries and so he, was, he sat this day at the table and he said to his mother that is to my mother his wife and to all of us there will be another war in 20 years now that's 1919 the boys were coming home from Europe after the first world war and mother said to him Joseph why do you say that look at our sons they'll all be just right for a war, a war if it's going to happen in another 20 years he said it will take place in another 20 years and he even named the opponents he named Germany Italy and Japan Japan was not in the last in the first world war and Italy was not on the side of Germany it was on the side of the Allies he named these three he got it from the captains and he got it from the stewards and he got it from the officers of the ships that he supplied and he believed what they said and he simply expressed what he heard but he heard it and he believed it well the war broke exactly 20 years later on the 1st of September 1939 when England declared war on Germany as Germany moved into Poland now here that's no prophecy it's simply that these words are coming to pass a simple little man in a little island unknown to the world and he is voicing something he was not alone because he was only giving voice to those things said to him aboard the ships and that's how man thought and today man is thinking in the same way misusing his one talent which is his speech and his mind you could start now to counteract all the nonsense in the papers and all the nonsense on TV and radio by simply assuming that you are what you would like to be ignoring everything that would oppose it and dare to assume it to the point of self-conviction that you believe it <clears throat> And do you know it will come to pass? For this is the coin of heaven. One morning back in 1954, I think it was, 
my wife awoke from this deep, deep sleep with an audio vision for the voice is speaking from the depths of her own self and speaking to her. And these are the words. You must stop spending your thoughts, your time, and your money. Everything in life must be an investment. She came rushing into the living room to the library. And there she took the dictionary out to see the difference in meaning between the words spending and investing. And the difference was to spend is to lay out without hope of return. While to invest is to expect return on equity. One is to not expect anything on what you do and the other is to expect a return on equity. But they mentioned three things. You also have time that you must invest, not spend. Your thoughts must be invested and not spent. And your money, invested and not spent. So you must stop spending your thoughts, your time and your money. Everything in life must be an investment. Now she wrote those words for me back in 1954, I think it was. It's a vision, a perfect vision for everyone to take hold of and apply it. So I know what to do, but am I doing it? You read the morning paper, and then you're disturbed, and you do not know the characters spoken of, but you're disturbed by the things read. And then you react, and you're wasting your thoughts, your time, at that moment. It may even force you to go out and do something concerning the money that you have. Someone is putting on pressure to get you to invest in a certain thing, and it's not an investment at all, it is a waste. But at least you have control over your thought and over your time. If I give my time to reading the idle paper or some little trivia that someone suggests that I should read, or will I take it into the book called The Word of God and read God's Word? And take the Word as I did today. I took the Word way. And then, as I took the Word way, and it leads you into trade. Now listen to the word trade. The same meaning, the same word. It's Derek. <coughs> Wherever the sole of your foot shall tread, I have given you. Can you imagine such a fantastic gift? Wherever the sole of your foot shall tread, I have given to you. In the first chapter, the third verse of Joshua. I don't care what it is. Well, now the same word trade is conversation. So I'm treading out the wine press as I sit alone and carry on my conversations. And whatever I am actually doing in my conversation, I'm treading out. That's the wine press. And what am I treading? The bitter wine or the sweet wine? It's entirely up to me. Wherever the sole of your foot shall tread, that I have given to you. It's done for me. So I can sit down and bring you into my mind's eye and simply tread it. Have you tell me what physically you haven't told me, but I wish you had told me, and you would like to tell me, and simply carry on a conversation, which is the dialogue. I hear you tell me, and I rejoice in what you tell me, and then I congratulate you in what you have told me, but do I believe it? That is investing my time. That's investing my thought. And it works that way. As I told you here recently, the lady did not come back to thank me physically when she was here opening night. But back in June of last year, of this year, pardon me, June this year, she wrote a letter asking me to use my imagination on her behalf that she would like to dispose of a certain property. And she's asking five hundred or six hundred and fifty thousand dollars for it. Well, I did not know what it was, but she asked it of me, and I invested my time on her behalf. I invested my thought on her behalf. I heard her tell me that all that she asked of me has happened. That's all that I heard. Then I dropped it. It only took me, what, a half minute. <clears throat> to work myself up into that emotional state of feeling a happy state for her. 
She was here opening night. She hasn't been back since. But I got a letter from her two or three weeks ago telling me that everything she asked of me has come to pass. And she also added to that, and many more. So, if what she said is true, then she sold the property that she had valued at $650,000. Plus many things more, she said. Now, all that it took from me is to invest my thought, to invest my time. I charge her nothing for it. She has not given me one penny. I do not expect her to give me one penny for it. There was no arrangement between us. She only asked me to use my imagination lovingly on behalf of her. And so I have the time, and I have the thought, and I have the gift. The gift is my own wonderful human imagination, which is God, and the ability to speak. And so I carried on the dialogue. So our control in a dialogue is far more rewarding than you'll ever know if you try it. Then it becomes a habit, and all through the day you find yourself investing rather than spending. If you catch yourself spending, you stop it, because that's a waste. And then you put on a new record. So take off the old man, the old nature, which belongs to the former conversations, and put on the new nature, which belongs after the image of God. Read that in the fourth chapter of Ephesians. So I'm only quoting from Scripture. It's all there if man could only see it. But then man is put upon his own. He has to stand upon his own feet and become the operant power. You just can't turn around and say, well, I am doing something good in the world, therefore God will reward me. Listen to the words. I am the Lord. There is no other. Besides me, there is no God. He actually became as we are, that we may be as he is. And his name forever and forever is I am. So when you are told, I am the Lord, it's just as though you said, I am the I am. For the word translated Lord means I am. So I am the I am. And there is no other. Besides me, there is no God. So that is the God of Scripture. Your own wonderful human imagination is God. And there is no other God. Now you have been given the gift of God, which is the ability to speak and to form thoughts, to form images in your mind's eye. And now you were told to go out, because before I, this very day, I set before you both good and evil. Choose either one, but I suggest you choose life rather than death. Choose the good rather than the evil. Choose the blessing rather than the cursing. So in the very beginning, he created, he created me at the very beginning of his way, of his conversation. So as we are told by the great bard, it hath been taught us from the primal state that he which is was wished until he were. And he never wavered in that wish. Let us make man in our image. And so, he did it in love, and love is not love which alters when it alteration finds. So I see something that I love dearly, and I wish something wonderful for it. Then I hear a rumor, or I even see something that is in conflict with what I have heard. But love is not love which alters when it alteration finds. So I go back to what I actually heard, and I persist in the hearing, and persist in that and then it conforms to what I have heard and continue to hear. So that is how we create in this world. But if I allow my senses to dictate the change and then accept the evidence of my senses, well then I'm not really applying this door wisely. I must deny the evidence of my senses unless they conform to what I have assumed that I want to be in this world. I must deny reason if it is in conflict with what I really want to have real in my world. And if I do it, I will get the evidence in my world. It will come. So we have the coin of heaven. The two sides of the coin is the gift of God to man and to no other mortal creature. And the gift is mind and speech. And with these two, 
he is, does not differ in any respect from the immortals. And when he sheds this little body of his, these will be his guides. And by then he'll be led into the troop of the gods and into the company of the souls who have attained to immortality, attained to bliss. So tonight you take me seriously and try it. If you do not want something for yourself, there is some friend you want it for. And without his consent, without his knowledge, don't tell him. You simply assume that he is the man that you like him to be. Or she is the woman you would like her to be. And you persist in that assumption without their knowledge. If it's loving, it doesn't really matter if they know it. Always exercise it lovingly on behalf of another. And if you do it, then you're not using cursing. You're using a blessing. And if you do it lovingly, then you're doing the good thing. And you're doing the lovely thing in this world. And so you avoided that little pitfall because he gave you both. I lay before you this day both good and evil. Life and death. Blessing and cursing. For he said in Deuteronomy again in the 32nd chapter. I, even I, am he. And there is no God beside me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. And there is none that can deliver out of my hand. So it's entirely up to me what choice I'm going to make. I can kill, I can make alive. I can wound and I can heal. I can bless and I can curse. But we are told, choose life. So you are the very one that in the very beginning he created for his own glory and gave you himself. He actually became as we are with all of the weaknesses and all the limitations of man that we in time may become as he is fully conscious of the gift that he gave us, mind and speech. And through these gifts we are immortal, creating anything, because now we have the choice of anything, but we know what to choose. But you take it seriously, and this very day, in spite of what the papers will say concerning unemployment, concerning the lack of this and the lack of that and all the things, ignore it. And see yourself gainfully employed if that's what you want. And in spite of the freeze, see yourself making more than you've ever made before. Not rubbing someone out, leave them alone. Not rubbing anyone out or displacing anyone. Hear good news for them. And you go from step to step. The man who now sits in the White House, he had no beginning any more than we had. He came from a very poor little family, a grocery store, was the background. He failed miserably running for governor of this state. He failed running for the presidency the first time. Who would have thought he had one chance of a snowball in hell to sit in the White House? And there he is now. And no one can deny that he is the president of this fabulous country. There he is. And his chances of success, depending upon how he applies this law, are very good if he applies it wisely for the second term. It's entirely up to him if he knows this law. But he must have some knowledge of this law, having failed so miserably in one of 50 states to run for governor, and then to come back and run for the head of 50 states and get it. But that's the man. And if he knows this principle and doesn't play too much politics, playing appearances, then you can't stop him. But does he know it? I do not know if he knows it or not. I only know this is the law taught in Scripture. And scripture teaches it. Whatever you desire, believe you've received it. And you will. And whoever says to this monk can be removed and cast into the sea and does not doubt in his heart that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Can you imagine such a fantastic promise? That a man sitting alone, having no background whatsoever, and everything is against him, and he has a talent to become the man he wants to be by simply using this gift. And he sits down and communes with himself, as we are told in the fourth psalm. Be angry, but sin not. Commune with your own heart upon your beds and be silent. Be angry, but sin not. Or right, you can blow your top if you want to. But sin not. What means sin not? 
To know what to do or not to do it is to sin. That's sinning. The word sin means to miss the mark. So you know what to do. If you don't do what you know you ought to do, then you're sinning. Now you're told, you will die in your sins unless you believe that I am he. So a man who does not believe that he himself is the God to whom you formerly prayed, will die in his sins because he's going to pray to a false God. If he turns on the outside, there is no outside God. I am the Lord. Besides me, there is no other. There is no other God. I am the only Lord. Your own wonderful consciousness. That wonderful human imagination is God. And so if you don't believe in it, you die in your sins. Therefore, you will not do what you ought to do. So the Bard was quite right, because it's not the easiest thing to do. So he said, I can easier teach 20 what were good to do than to be one of the 20 to follow my own teaching. Let us now go out determined not to falter, but to actually follow our own teaching. Know what to do, carry on an inner conversation from the premise of the wish fulfilled, and then persist in that assumption. And if I, this night on my bed, if I keep that story before me, as the fourth chapter of Psalm tells me, the fourth Psalm, commune with your own heart upon your bed, and then be silent. Commune in what sense? Carry on a dialogue. What dialogue? From the premise of my wish fulfilled. Well, with whom would I share it? Well, I would share it with my wife, first of all. Then my daughter would be the next one to know it. Then my circular friends would come into it. They would know it. Well, then, carry on the dialogue with them. Have them congratulate you on your good fortune. And then accept it as an accomplished fact. It will be done for you. And fall asleep in that dialogue. Don't argue. That will only imply that you're not aware of it. That is something to be done. That uh, some obstacle to be overcome. No, you go to the end of the matter. Always go to the end. And if I dwell in the end as though it were present, well then that's all that I do. Then I sleep with that assumption. So I assume the feeling of the wish fulfilled and then sleep in that assumption. And then carry on the dialogue from that assumption. And this control in a dialogue is far more rewarding than you'll ever dream of. It comes out in actual fruit, bearing the fruit of that assumption. So this is the gift that God gave to every being born a woman and to no other mortal creature. And the gift is mind and speech. And these two, mind and speech, this is equivalent to that of immortality. And if a man uses them wisely, he differs in no respects from the immortals. And when he takes off this little garment, as he must eventually, they will be his guides. And they will take him into the truth of the gods and into the souls who have attained to bliss, those who are in control of their thought and their speech. So we stop spending our thoughts, our time and our money, and we start to invest our thought and our time and our money. For everything in life must be an investment. So if you're riding on the streetcar, you're riding on a bus, don't idle the time, close your eyes to the obvious, it's not altogether attractive, and carry on your inner dialogue and invest that time. By the time you get to your destination, you've invested wisely between getting on the bus and getting off if it's only 20 blocks away. And you spent that in a very wise manner. And you've actually used the coin of heaven. He gave you the coin of heaven. Before you judge it, try it. May I tell you, if you try it wisely and really believe in it, It'll prove itself in the testing. And then it doesn't really matter what others will say. You have found that it works. You have the evidence to support it. So it doesn't really matter what the world will say if you try to open up some conversation with a friend or a total stranger. Concerning this, they might laugh at you, but it doesn't really matter. You remain unshaken. I have had moments when you are in a party and you do not know the people 
and something leads from this to that and suddenly you find yourself breaking into a conversation of this nature and they become indifferent and they turn their back and go elsewhere perfectly all right I'm not offended when it happens that way it doesn't really matter one night many years ago he's now gone from this world you might have known him by his reputation Walter Dambrosch he was a great musician and I met him at the Harvard Club in New York City and this friend of mine introduced me to him and introduced me as a great metaphysician which is silly I never identify myself with metaphysics at all although the word is very good but Damrosch said to me and what school is your background Germanic school or the French school of metaphysics or what school of metaphysics and I said none it's only my own visions well Damrosch just simply with it turned around and walked away completely uh, ignored me completely from that moment on he had to have some school recognized school the Germanic school if I could say well I studied the Germanic concept of metaphysics or the French concept or the English concept no I said I have no background of that nature it's only what I have actually experienced I'm talking about my own personal experience and Damrosch turned around and off he went and that was his meeting with me for just one short little moment now he is gone and my friend who introduced me to him he is gone too from this world and there is no transforming power in death as we are so we are there none whatsoever if I'm a thief there I'm a thief there if I'm stupid here I'm just a stupid there and so if I'm looking for some background of the Germanic background I'm looking for it there too and you'll go blindly by and he'll walk by and no one will recognize him he is bringing light into the world he came into the world the world was made by him and the world knew him not he came to his own and his own knew him not they turn their backs upon him as he comes into the world and tells of the world how it's brought into being through the word of God then he tells you that you are God and asks you to imitate God as their children well if God did it this way and I must imitate him as a dear child tell me exactly how he did it for we are told through faith we understand that the worlds were created by the word of God so that things that are seen were made out of things which do not appear is that how it's done it does not yet appear what we shall be all right but I will assume that I am what I would like to be and it has not yet appeared is that how he did it yes he calls the thing that isn't seen as though it were and the unseen becomes seen well now I'll do the same thing if I must imitate him as a dear child so it is not yet real in my world that I am the man that I like to be well I will dare to assume that I am and to prove it I will carry on this inner dialogue with a circle of friends that would know it when it happened but I'll carry it on not as something to be something that is already so I'll carry it on from the premise of the wish fulfilled and sleep in that assumption just as though it were true and see how it works then it works and when it happens it all happens in such a marvelous way that you think it would have happened anyway it always works that way it is so simple and the ways are so perfect that when it happens you're inclined to say to yourself and your friends will convince you well you know it would have happened anyway you see how it happened Look, you met so and so and so and so introduced you to so and so and through these introductions it happened now would I have met this one and would he have introduced me to that one and therefore would it have happened had I not preceded the entire meeting by my assumption and of course then they have the big question mark well it would have happened anyway and many a person will say that because when it happens it always happens so naturally even if it comes suddenly it is still in a natural way that it happens nothing comes out of the clouds and drops in your lap a huge bag of money no if it happens it's going to happen naturally even though it surprises your friends and surprises you 
is going to happen in a very normal, natural manner. So I appeal to you to use your time and your thoughts wisely by investing them rather than spending them. And you can start now, this very moment, to invest your time, invest your thought. And in the not distant future, you'll get the fruit of the investment. For to invest is to expect returns on your equity. And you have equity in the ability to think, and to think in terms of images, think in terms of thoughts. And you have time. So you can actually take it now and invest it. As I read scripture, and you take one word and go through the concordance with the one word and find from Genesis to Revelation the use of that word. And how the translator, for all translations are really, well, what the translator believes the artist or the author intended. So it's entirely up to him. They're all paraphrases anyway. So why the King James Version will take the word conversation and the other one will take, the Revised Standard Version will take the same word and use the word way. And then you're confused. What does it mean? Look up the word. It does mean both. Now which one is using the word that the author intended? So if I put off the old nature which belongs to the old conversation and then the other one tells me I put off the old nature which belongs to the old way which is simply the course of life. And the way used in one is used conversation in another, and used treading in another, and used path in another, and the same word Derek, that's the Hebrew word for it. So the one who is going to paraphrase the script, he has to feel what he believes the author intended when he wrote the word. But if you take it all together, and if you test it, you will see they're all right. It is a way. And the early Christians were called the people of the way. They found out the way. Now he said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. It's like saying they were then, I am the conversation. And he does tell us that. So the words that I speak are not mine, but the words of him who said me. So he is the conversation piece. Now, make him my way. Take his word to make them my words. For if you believe that I am he, right. If you do not believe that I am he, you die in your sins. Continue missing the mark from now until the end when you actually believe that I am he. So if you do not believe that you yourself are the center of scripture, that you are the God spoken of, well then, you'll continue to miss your mark. The day you actually will accept it, that you are the being spoken of in scripture as God, as the Lord Jesus, if you believe it, you'll begin to test it. If all things are possible to him, then you begin to actually take it into your own hands to do something about it. If I am he, and all things are possible to him, well, how did he do it? He brought it into being with the word. Now listen to the word. The word that proceeds from my mouth shall not return unto me void, but shall accomplish that which I purpose, and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and prosper in the thing for which I sent it. Now, that same being that is speaking is speaking in you. You believe you can speak a word by actually assuming that it is so. Now, as, as you assume that it is so, you've sent it on its way. It cannot return unto you empty. It must accomplish that which you purpose and prosper in the thing for which you sent it. If you want to quote, it is from the 55th chapter of the book of Isaiah. That's how God brings things into the world, and then I'm invited to be an imitator of God as a dear child. So tonight, take me seriously, and go out determined to prove or disprove what I've told you. I ask you to try it. You will not in eternity disprove it, may I tell you. For I am telling you what I know from experience. I am not theorizing. This is fact. And therefore not a thing in this world can stop you from becoming what you want to be, but yourself. 
if you allow a seeming object in the world called another to argue out of this concept, all well and good. It's entirely up to you. If you believe that there's evil in the world, you've got to fight the evil and join this and join that and join the other, all entirely up to you. If instead of fighting the evil, you choose the good, instead of cursing states, you choose the blessing. And choose life instead of death. All right, then you go about your own business, investing your time, investing your thought, and investing your money, rather than spending these things in the world. For all these joiners are only spending. That's all they're doing. And they're the ones who get all the publicity in the paper. And the paper from beginning to end is based upon a negative state.